Thank you. The longer you clap, the less time we have for questions. So, so uh, we have, I think, 12 minutes by my clock. So let's get as many as we can. And what I think I'm going to do is take them in bunches of three and then go from one panelist to another. Please. Hi, um, can everyone hear And me? if you are asking someone specifically, do say so. Yeah. No, it's for everybody. So we were talking about blasphemy, but we know how dangerous it is for people. And y yesterday, Pervez mentioned about the cartoons, and I did take that to heart. So when do you think we should like strike the balance between being blasphemous and being honest so that we can move forward, but then also being safe? Because I, I don't want like, young people to you know, watch this if they live in very restrictive families to sort of do something that's going to get them either murdered or beaten or harassed. So what kind of advice would you give somebody who's young, or not even if they're young, if they're in a vulnerable position, but they, they want to go forward and, and, and be part of this? What would you say? Yeah, can we have uh, one more question, please? Yeah. No. It's not specially a question, you know. I uh, I just want to precise something. For me, blasphemy, use this word of blasphemy, it's putting ourselves, you know, in the side of the religion. Because when we believe in civil laws, we cannot speak about blasphemy. Because blasphemy is for the people who believe in a religion. And for that, I think it's very important to, to speak in, uh, as a citizen of the world, you know. And before we are going, I hope one day, to ask for laicity, international laicity in the world, I think we have to ask for civil law all around the world. So don't use blasphemy, please. This word is not for us. I totally agree. Blasphemy should not be, it's not our vocabulary, it's not universal vocabulary, but our opponents are smart enough. In Poland we have, uh, it is not called blasphemy. It's called, and the similar law is, for example, in France, it's called offense against religious feelings. Now, uh, so we have to be smart too. First of all, feelings could not, could not be offended. The person could be offended, but the, uh, the subject is always the same. It's religion and that we have to fight. What I'll do is we'll go one by one from the left to the right and then we'll take three more questions and then let's see how. So if you can keep responses brief, yeah, yeah thanks. For sure. Just so, okay, so um, I know that I think there's some material floating around with my background. I was actually disowned by my parents. Um, it's been 10 years, and um, I'm very open about it now, but I questioned, I started questioning Islam from a very um, young age, and my parents had actually moved to the United States in the 70s. Um, so you would assume that they were the type of people that would be a little bit more open-minded, but they didn't um, see it that way, and they thought I was... Um, I, I, corrupted, that you know, I wasn't pure, that I was a dishonor to their family. Um, so it's been 10 years on my own, so I put myself through college. Um, I just graduated from law school, a newly minted lawyer. Um, and that was something that I made a conscious decision to do. And it's scary. It is, I mean, to this day, I think I grapple with severe anxiety and a lot. I've been in therapy for 10 years, um, which I do recommend. But, you know, what I would say, and this is something that I would like to work on long term, is to come up with um, guidebooks and publications and speaking to let, especially like ex-Muslim women that are in these situations, to have like a network for them, to have a support system for them. I lucked out because I, um, my university helped me quite a bit um, to transfer me over to an independent status and then I qualified for a lot of grants. Um, to continue on. But I think there just has to be a safety net that we create as an alternative to the family safety net that's keeping them. Um, a lot of um, ex-Muslims in, in, in these family situations. Um, and that's something that I would love to work towards. Um, and it's not just financial. I do think that it's um, psychological as well. So it's developing an alternate community, which I think we're doing here. I really do think we're doing here um, and, and, and networking with each other so that we can, we can catch them before they fall. That's what I would recommend doing.
I would, I would, I will try to uh, to answer on everything quickly um, about um, blasphemy being dangerous and what can we do with that. Well, to this, you know, I, I think they use this those threats. They create a danger for us, for those who are committing blasphemy. They create it because that's the main instrument for them to stop the blasphemy. When it's one blasphemer, when it's two or three blasphemers, it's very easy to stop them, of course putting them in, in danger. But when it's all room like this, are going out and committing blasphemy in different way, they can't stop you anymore. That's, that's, that's what philosophy of activism and revolution is, right? Uh, one person can inspire, but the main job has to be done by, by big community. And this is, yeah, this is what we have to do. And about blasphemy um, as a word that we sh should not use um, because it has a bad meaning, I do agree, but I also agree that the meaning, the bad meaning is because we, we think so, because we also accept the point of view of religious institutions. They put a bad meaning in this world. For me, blasphemy is, is a celebration of freedom of speech and I, have a per I, I, I enjoy this word and I want to use it. So um, I'm actually really glad that you asked this question uh, because I wanted to talk about this as well. Um, I was personally very touched by, uh, I, so I'm I was born in Pakistan. I still have family, very close family that lives in Pakistan. Um, I have family that are sh from Shia background, so they're part of a s minority that's targeted all the time. Um, and, you know, they're relatively middle class, so they're relatively still safe. But I hear about the ones who are not that, you know, wealthy enough to have, to be living in military compounds, which is where anybody with money in Pakistan lives nowadays. Um, so my point is that I think that this is a conversation that needs to be had between those people, those of us for whom blasphemy is a, sim is a very important symbol of our right to be able to speak freely, to not have to capitulate to you know, religious dogma, to not have to censor ourselves, and those people who would like those same rights but literally right now live in a place where they are targeted. I think that we have a relatively, we have an, a, a space here, first of all, we are right here in this room in a very great space surrounded by like-minded people. Even when we go outside, we are still in a relatively safe space, most of us. We're going back in London, or in my case, in Toronto, Canada. I can call the police if somebody threatens me. There's a lot of privileges that I have just being here, which I want to preserve. And that's why I want to make sure that this doesn't, Islamism and other kinds of religious far right um, dogma doesn't take over here. But there are people, and I think this is maybe what Professor Hoodboy was mentioning, that for some people, they have a certain consequences they deal with. They don't have the privilege of being able to call 999 or 911 and be safe, be secure. Does that mean we should censor ourselves? I don't think so. I disagree with that. But I think that there is a conversation and maybe there's some middle ground. Maybe what we need to think of it, we've talked a lot about human rights. I believe in human rights. I, I do a lot of work for it. But maybe we all should need to think about a little bit about human responsibilities and how we can have the conversation and express ourselves freely in a way that actually empowers those who are actually being victimized by these blasphemy laws. So. I agree as well, uh, I'm going to respond to Aliyah's question. I agree as well that it's, um, it's very important to create the support systems outside. Um, we can create the, the safety nets, the social nets, um, uh, by bringing people together, sharing their experience, speaking about it. And it, it, it actually helps when you speak to someone who's been through the same thing. You learn from each other and, and you bring all the anger out. So that's important. But it's all, I think it's also important to bring in specialists so we can um, partner up with um, women rights organization. They'll be working on domestic cases, um, forced marriages, um, other things to do um, with uh, gender specific uh, issues. We can, um, there's also the asylum system, um, which, which is a system we should also prevent because this is one of the ways um, um, to, to help people 
uh, remain secure and safe. Um, and something that has been fought for for ages, so it's something we need also to protect. Um, psychological support as well, um, many psychological organizations, psychiatrists, um, who could also, we need to bring these in to sort of provide some, some sort of support in a way. Um, yeah, basically creating the support network and collaborating with other specialist organizations. We don't have to do all the work, but we can. We need we need to do lots of networking and sort of collaborations. Yeah. So I have three minutes, and I have seen three hands. So let's all talk as if we are on Twitter. Yeah. So the lady over there, then I have Mariam, and there's a gentleman there. Sorry, I can. I mean, I can I take four? Yeah. Okay. Then the two gentlemen at the back. Yeah. But the lady over there first. Yeah. Thank you very much for this amazing panel. And uh, Karen, it's really a nice speech. Thank you very much. Um, actually, my question was already uh, questioned. I, I really don't feel safe here in London. And, um, I, I, and uh, about this Islamic homophobia, uh, Islamic phobia, sorry, Islamophobia. I mean, if, it, if you are not going to have a phobia of Islam, what else would you have? Of course, we have Islamophobia, especially for me after what I've been through from Islamists. Even here, when I came here, and I, I can't really express myself, and I cannot really talk about Islam that much because I really feel afraid. I, I, maybe someone in the street like uh, chop my head off. Like I, I really I look at my back when I am walking because I, I didn't process what happened to me yet. But uh, yeah, thank you, Alia, for asking the question, and that's what I really, how can we be safe and speak our minds, really? Um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to quickly uh, point to the importance of this discussion. I think uh, in um, we've had uh, discussions throughout these two days where there's been conversations about how there's this tension, you know, tension between secularists who can be Muslim and not, or uh, atheists, and then others who are criticizing religion. I don't see why that should be a tension. The reality is that I don't feel uncomfortable if there is a secularist who is a believer. A believer who is a secular should not be uncomfortable if I am an atheist and want to criticize religion. I mean, I think there is truly a distinction between religion, between the religious right, and between people. Of course, human beings are worthy of the greatest respect, but, uh, and, I, and I do agree that our focus is the religious right, but I'm sorry, we cannot leave religion alone. When we are being called kafirs, monafirs, um, day in and day out, and when our lives are threatened as well, not just in Pakistan and Iran, but right here in the West, we also have a responsibility to be able to speak out and to criticize, uh, particularly when the religious rights banner is these very texts and books. And therefore, I think we have to, believing secularists have to give the space. And I think, in fact, the more that we push, the more blasphemy and apostasy we commit, the better it is for believers as well, because there are many believers who are are being charged with apostasy and blasphemy in countries because Islamists and the religious right cannot tolerate dissent. It is us, actually, that are on the front lines as opening the space and pushing uh, this space open for believers as well. And therefore, we do expect a lot more support from believing secularists. Thank you. The, the gentleman in the white shirt and then the gentleman in the, in the bluish shirt, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, firstly, thank you very much uh, for being at the front line, you beautiful, brave people. Thank you for that. And uh, my question is, uh, I believe that majority of Muslims are peaceful, but a majority within that majority don't hold extreme views, but they do believe in certain acts, aspects like uh, being gay, it's not okay, you're going to hell for that, women cannot marry no, uh, non-Muslims. And if we address those issues, perhaps we will be able to deal with the ISIS kind of situations because we are not dealing with the prevention and we end up dealing with you know ISIS and there will be other organizations coming up in the future, they had been in the past. So how to address that as a society uh, and how we can, uh, you know, uh, pull the carpet uh, uh, under their feet. Thank you. I mean, I, um, 
I work for a Christian organization, actually, and I uh, just want to thank you for today. Um, and my question is, uh, do you think that you can effectively tackle these issues caused by extreme and socially conservative expressions of faith groups without involving and working with moderate and progressive expressions of those faith, faith groups? I appreciate um, you value our support and you respect us as individuals, but can you do what you want to do without involving us? But what I think we are going to do is maybe two sentences or three sentences each, each from each of us for one last word, weaving in some of these very important questions. Thank you. Starting maybe this time from you. Okay, I'll make a, um, a quick comment on the contribution from here. So I think one of the other things um, that could feed into the discussion here about what people can do, um, not feeling safe here. Um, uh, Kiran mentioned the, the police and how, how we're privileged. One of the issues we need to work with, um, we, need, we need to... We need to get the police to understand the seriousness of the issue. Because I, I know myself and many others have been uh, reporting this to the police. They have no, well, we can make a couple of assumptions. Either they have no ex um, experience dealing with, with such cases or they don't want to get involved. Um, so we have lots of work to do in terms of um, influencing the police to, to get them really involved in understanding the seriousness of the issue. Um, that's just, just a quick thing to, to add to um, the support systems. The, the other thing, a response um, to the gentleman over here. Um, yeah, I can't, see, I can't see a problem with working with secularists from whatever background. If we all agree on the same um, main um, foundations, I can see a problem. There are lots of other organizations, not only Christian, there's the British Muslims for Secular Democracy here that also promote secularism. They're, they're, they're still having their, their private, their view, their, religious views as a private view. Um, so I can see a problem with partnering with other organizations as long as everyone agrees on the uh, main foundations. Yeah, I want to say um, uh, thank you to everybody who's asked and commented. I, I'm, I'm going to respond also to the person from, uh, from the Christian publication. Uh, I think that we can work with secularists. I agree with Nala. Um, we do have allies among secular Muslims, uh, you know, various secular groups um, that happen to be, uh, or happen, or individuals that are, um, that have faith in, in a religion of, of one kind. In fact, in uh, XMNA and in the CMB uh, forum anyway, we have, for example, deists and, um, you know, agnostic uh, Muslims and things like that. So we're not against people who might have some personal faith. It's about keeping that separate from public life, from po politics. It's also about f um, not having to censor ourselves and not having to necessarily, um, you know, of course it should come with a sense of uh, civil discourse, but I think that, uh, for example, I've, had, I've known people who are progressive Muslim, uh, you know, who have everything else in common with, except for the fact that I don't believe in their religion. Uh, really not like the fact that I don't believe in their religion and that's the one thing and that, you know, that they just cannot accept that. Uh, and I, even though we never would have that conversation, but that somehow is an offensive thing that I'm an ex-Muslim. So I think that we, it has to go both ways and we have to find common ground and I think it's possible. Um, so I think, uh, I hope to, I hope so. I'll answer with that. Again, shortly on everything about um, danger and uh, what to do with that? Well, I think that we should just stop to expect that it will not be dangerous. It, it is dangerous, right? And this is why we, we understand that it's dangerous and this is why there is such a big to do it. And just imagine for a moment a world or your, or your life if there would not be such a resistance like, like all of us. That would be much more dangerous. That, that danger is worse. Um, about Miriam, what she said, um, it's uh, like uh, I, I totally agree. Just I want, I want to add that blasphemy and critic of religion and all those entire religious, if we can call it, um, acts, they they are they don't have any meaning to offend. What we have to do is with those acts, we have to treat them 
as a lesson. We all have to learn to laugh at each other, to criticize, to question our ideas. And as feminists, we're always, as feminine activists, we're always, I don't know, um, uh, we, we have a kind of critics of being hysterical or we have funny drawings or, or whatever. We are laughing, we just accept it, it's funny. Because sometimes, yeah, we are hysterical, we're very angry. You know, so, so let's, um, just what we have to learn is that everybody has to accept to be criticized. The, uh, we have to accept that our ideas can be questioned and we have to do it all together. Um, and to Christian uh, worker of Christian organization, um, as everybody already said here, um, the conf this conference and each of us, we definitely don't see how we can succeed separating from um, moderate religious people. And for example, me personally right now, um, I, would, I want to propose you to collaborate. 25th of November, Pope is coming to speak in European Parliament in France, in Strasbourg. I propose you to collaborate against, against and to do an, an actions uh, protest and talks against against such a thing, such an event that is a direct attack on secularism. Let's do it. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first question about how do we, how do we? What was I think you said something about pulling. Right. There is a the cause or women cannot marry uh, men kind of thoughts. If we deal with that situation there, we perhaps will not see the extreme right. ends at the later stage. So what you're pointing out and what I'm seeing is that, that those are all related to social policy, those are social issues. And I might get a little more academic here again, but um, what I've noticed, and this is from the studies mostly in international affairs, um, when it comes to democracy um, and democratic state systems, the state models, what, what differentiates them from other types of theocratic or, you know, um, you know like, I'm trying to, to, to like a one set mind sort of state model is um, really the concept of civic engagement. Um, and that's something that, in civic engagement, I'm talking about everything from like book clubs and onwards, you know, to, to have people really sit down together and do activities or network in ways that don't have to be polar. And the more you get to know your neighbors, which is something that I've noticed is a big deal in the United States and why I think Muslim communities are very different in the United States, I think a lot more integrated, not assimilated, but integrated than they are um, in the United Kingdom and, and to an extent in Canada as well, is that we are a community we're like, you know, you're in Houston versus, you know, East London. There's a huge difference, even though they all have the same sort of belief systems in a lot of ways. There's a lot of Muslims living in East London. There's a lot of Muslims living in Houston. What's the difference there? I think that it's the civic engagement. I think it's the fact that in the United States, to an extent, they do overlap, all the communities overlap regardless of belief. So I think that's something we really should push um, or else you're gonna see this sort of schism between these groups that becomes very black and white. Um, going to the second question, Interestingly enough, I actually just um, wrapped up work for a Christian organization in the United States, Volunteers of America, um, that has become secular over the years, but it has a Christian um, base to it. And that's, that was something that was very prevalent in the United States at the time that this organization came together. Um, I think it does require collaboration. I don't think it's possible to move forward with a secular model without recognizing that there's a diversity of beliefs, whether they're atheists, whether they're religious, um, and that for me, the issue is social policy. So if we can work together through civic engagement and through other means um, to make sure that social policy works for everybody, then I don't really care what you are believing in. I don't care if you're you know, astrologist or whatever. That's something that you keep to yourself. But as long as we can agree that we all need to be able to have laws that work for all of us. Yeah, 
very, very briefly, uh, conversations in good faith help. I mean, if someone believes that gays are not okay, it's all right if, you, if the person only believes that and doesn't impose it on others and doesn't act on that. I think the problem very often, the immediate problem to be dealt with is the physical violence on acts and homophobia that, that comes out of it, or violence against women who might wear miniskirts or whatever. I mean, if that's, and to stop that, I think it's the impulse to act on the basis of that. That needs to be, that needs to be worked on first, and probably one way to get around it is having some kind of a conversation in good way, faith rather than, uh, feeling self-righteous about it. I mean, because there is self-righteousness on the other side. So why play the same game? I mean, that's one way of looking at it. And one final point that I wanted to bring in is that there was there is a Hindu guru called Swami Vivekananda, and his he once was very angry when he saw a lot of Hindu temples being de destroyed by Muslim rulers in India, and he therefore wanted to act against it, and he was really angry about it. And he says he had a revelation. And the goddess came to him and said that, are you there to protect me or am I there to protect you? And I think that's the critical lesson that all those people who claim blasphemy and saying that I'm here to protect Jesus or Ram or Allah or whatever need to know that they are supposed to be far superior. You know, they are supposed to look after you. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Yeah.